Amazing. Thank you. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, hopefully everyone is having a fantastic morning wherever you are. Um, I'm excited to spend some time with you. Should I, um, I will screen share for my slides, Rebecca and Josh, or you'll have them. Um, right. If you want to screen share. Perfect. You yep, perfect. I will do that so everyone can see my slides. And all right, say so everyone see the slides? Yep. Awesome. All right, great. So um, I figured I would start off just telling everyone a little bit about myself, um, a little bit about me um, before I even get to what patient experience is. Um, I feel like sometimes it's a word maybe, and it's a part of our of the healthcare industry people know about. Some people don't know about it. So I always say that I have a very eclectic and interesting approach and, and career path in healthcare. I uh, did not always know I wanted to work in healthcare. I never thought I was going to work in healthcare, uh, but here I am today, uh, nine years later. So my journey started back, I was actually a theater performing arts major with a dance and business minor. Uh, I always joke and say that I'm probably the only person in the entire world that has that major and that minor together uh, on, in one undergrad experience. And I wanted to be an actor. Um, I wanted to be an actor on Broadway uh, because I wanted to be able to be in the moment, work with people and change people. And I was really, really passionate about that. And I was very proud to be one of the, the very few of my graduating class uh, to leave with an actual paid acting job, which not many of us do. Um, and uh, at the time though, I was uh, working through all throughout college and I put myself through college and I uh, was working in fashion and then got recruited and spent 11 years working in fashion uh, for brands like Nordstrom, Louis Vuitton. I did all of our merchandising, window displays, uh, fashion events. And so I spent 11 years in fashion. And I also loved the piece of fashion that every event was like a show. It was a production. It was something to start. It was something to create. It had a lot of moving pieces to it. And so I thought, all right, this is, this is my world. This will be where I'm going to land. Uh, and I spent 11 years there and I really loved it. Uh, and as you can imagine, fashion has all of the, the fun and crazy perks that you think you get from it. Um, it could also be really stressful, like, like many other industries. And I was then went back to grad school and I got my MBA in marketing and advertising. And that was around 2008 when uh, the economy was, was not doing great. And so there happened to be this temp assignment, but a temporary assignment um, with Northwell, covering someone's maternity leave for three months. And I was working part-time, going to school full-time. I said, you know what, this is perfect. I'll, I'll, do, I'll do this job for three months. How, how hard could it be? Little did I know that that three months was gonna change my life. Um, absolutely changed my life. Um, and I'll, when I'll kind of end, I'll end on a story that like literally came from that day. But essentially I worked in marketing, um, at, you know, helping the hospital with marketing, with community outreach, and kind of introducing high-end service uh, into, into hospitals. My three month assignment was over. I then said, uh, you know, all right, I'm, I've, I found another job in fashion. I said, this was great. Uh, and I actually was very fortunate enough to meet the executive director, the CEO of one of the hospitals. And her and I were talking and she says, come, come see me tomorrow. So I did, and she offered me a job. She offered me a job that didn't exist before to, to kind of combine all of these different things together. And I felt really great about it. I felt, of course, really proud to have been offered the job. And uh, a couple of days go by and I turn her down. And I said, you know, this is just not what I wanna do. Uh, you know, I'm not clinical, you know, I, you know, and I literally say, if I see blood, I will pass out. And if I see someone throw up, I will do it too. So I am not meant to be in a clinical setting and maybe some people are, and that's fantastic. We need people like that. So a couple of days goes by and I actually, this was just how I know it was fate. I run into her at a gym, completely outside of the hospital, completely in a different town. And she says to me, you know, I offered you a job and you didn't take it. That's really interesting. And of course I got very nervous. I felt so bad. I was like, oh my God, not, I mean no disrespect by that. You know, I sent my thank you card. I did all the things you're supposed to do when you turn down a job, when you go on an interview. And she said, you know, I know you've never worked in healthcare before, but trust me, this will change your life. And it'd be the biggest mistake if you don't work here. So we met again. 
we, we built kind of a platform that I said, you know, I want to be able to create things. I want to, I want to look at healthcare differently. I want to, uh, you know, I don't want to do it the way we just did it. I don't want to do it because we're a nonprofit. I don't want to hear those, those kind of restraints and those constrictions. I wanted to, to be able to create things like you do in theater, like you do in fashion. And she was supportive of it. Uh, and I was really lucky to have someone believe in me that much and someone to support me, to, to want me, for me to look at something differently in a room where people maybe historically haven't looked at it differently. So that was nine years ago. Uh, I've been at Northwell nine years now uh, in several different hospitals. Today, uh, I'm the vice president of uh, what we call experience services for all of New York City, uh, which covers three campuses and three hospitals. Um, and I never thought I'd be here. So I think it's a pretty cool story that sometimes, you know, there are so many different fields in healthcare, components to healthcare, and you don't, and I, we don't know about them, right? And so I think obviously this is such a great, you know, series and, and lecture to be able to do this because we're reaching people not, not only all over the country, but all over the world. And you're getting to learn about different, different pieces of what we do. Um, so I'm really excited to share, share it with you. So that is my, that's my story. That's how I got to, uh, to, to where I am. Uh, again, very untraditional, uh, but I wouldn't change it for the world. Uh, I wouldn't change it for the world. So let's talk patient and customer experience. So these four words here have been honestly, they've been in healthcare for so many years, but they've gained a lot of traction in the last 10. In the last 10 years, people start to hear this concept of patient and use the word even customer and talk about experience. And there's lots of different meanings to what this word means. And a lot of people think it means different things. And some people believe, well, is this the customer service department? Is this the complaint department? Is this where people go when they want, you know, a, a fancier food? Is this where people go when they, they want to file a complaint against the hospital? It, you know, what, what is it? What is patient and customer experience? And normally, right, we could, if I went around to everyone that was on this chat, right, and you could each tell me what you thought, at the end of the day, you, you would all be right, right? It's, it is the customer service team. It is the team that helps you. It is the special request team. It is the team that, that can help you do anything. And r really, at the end of the day, I look at patient experience with one very, very powerful word. And it's a word that I think in any industry holds a lot of power, but especially in ours at healthcare. And that word is perception. Patient experience is our patients and their families, whoever they define as a family. It's their perception of their experience here. It's their perception of how they felt. It's their perception of, did we spend enough time with them? It was their perception of, were we compassionate enough with them? Were we empathetic enough with them? Uh, was the environment clean? Was the environment quiet? Could they rest? Did they like their doctor, right? It's their perception of all of those things. And as we all know, perception's a very tricky thing. Sometimes the way you do something with your intention is not as how it's received. And I can I always give this very simple example of that in a hospital setting. And the example is someone, whether I'm a nurse, whether I'm a doctor, whether I'm a nursing assistant, whether I'm a dietitian, no matter who I am, I can walk into a patient's room, right? I knock on the door and and I say, oh, honey, how's it going today? And the patient says, oh, it's good, thank you so much. Oh, dear, don't worry, it's gonna be a, today's gonna be a great day, baby. I'm gonna take care of you. And someone uses words like that, honey, sweetie, baby, to be very endearing, to show compassion, to show empathy, to show how warm and connected they are. But the reality is, Mrs. Smith, that patient might be offended, right? She may not want you to call her those things, right? Because it's like, I'm, I'm not your honey. I'm not your sweetie, I'm not your baby. You don't know who I am. And some patients are gonna love it. They're gonna think, oh my God, look, this guy is so nice. She is so nice. And that's gonna be great. And there's always patients in the middle that maybe won't care if you say it or don't say it. It may be some of you, if you're thinking about how would you respond to that, some of you would say, oh wow, that would show me that this is a really nice caring person. Some of you would say, I would, it wouldn't matter to me if somebody used those words. And some of you might say, yeah, it might make me uncomfortable if someone says that. And in that moment, you have our staff member coming to the table thinking and walking away with the perception that they did a good thing, that they were compassionate and empathetic. And potentially you have the patient walking away from that thinking something very different. And that's their perception of what happened. 
And that's a tiny, tiny, small, very, very simple example of how you see things can just kind of snowball. Things can kind of really change when one person thinks it's one way and another person thinks it's another way. And we do, uh, we do a lot of education and a lot of training with all of our employees, our physicians, our nurses, everyone, because communication, as we all know, is so important. And it's, it, no matter what industry you're in, communication is important. And really looking at the things that make up communication, right? Because I always say that there's usually three big buckets of communication. We have verbal communication, right? Talking over the phone, talking in person. We have nonverbal communication, right? Which are things like eye contact, body language, right? Posture, right? Hand gestures. Um, and then, of course, there's, there's written communication, right? When we type or text each other or email, those are different. And within those three buckets, there are so many things that matter, right? Verbal communication is not just talking. It's tone. It's pitch. It's inflection. It's pace. It's volume. That changes everything, and that will change someone's perception. So when we talk about what patient and customer experience, it is anything and everything that the patient touches, feels, and experiences while they're here with us. And that can be clinical at moments. It can be service-oriented at moments. It can be about hospitality items. It could be uh, about food. It could be about communication. It could be about uh, anything that they have a question with. So it really becomes this big umbrella of things that fall into it, which, which I'm really grateful for because I look at that as an opportunity. We have the opportunity to impact and connect with a patient on so many different levels, on so many different programs. And I think that's really, really exciting. Now, having patients tell us what's going on is so important to them. And like any industry, right, whether you're in advertising, you're in sales, uh, no matter what industry, having patient, customer, or client, right, you can use any word you want to put there, having their feedback is extremely important, right? Hearing what they have to say. What do they like? What don't they like? Because as we know, sometimes as a customer, whether you're a customer at, a, at an Apple store, you're a customer at a hotel, you're a customer at a CVS, you're a customer at Target, we all have different expectations. You, you want different things. And we hope that the, that the company, that the brand listens to those things that you want. And our goal is not only to listen to them, but we want to anticipate your expectations and your needs, right? We want to be ahead of knowing what you need before you need it, right? Because a hospital's in the hospitality world. So having our patients speak to us is extremely important. And, and there's a very, I say there's a very informal way for them to do that, and there's a very formal way to do that. So a piece of what patient experience does is we, we round and we visit with patients. We try to see almost every patient in the hospital. Some days and some weeks that's not possible, but we try to see every single person. And not because something went wrong or there's a problem, but just because we wanna see how they're doing. We wanna get feedback from them. Was this experience what they thought it would be? What could we have done to improve it? And that's the informal process. And patients, especially right now, um, it's just incredible the amount of amazing letters we get, um, truly. And I, you know, I, I, I could spend a whole hour, I've got a folder here full of letters, of positive letters, of people saying thank you for saving their life. And we got that before COVID, and we're always so grateful to have someone write back and take the time to write something. And we always say we take the time to read it. And now during, you know, I've missed this, this COVID pandemic that we are all getting through in our own way. Um, and I'm, we're very proud of what we've been able to do here at Northwell and at Lenox Hill. Uh, the letters we get every day of people thanking us are incredible. And we really, it's, it touches your heart in a different way when you can read a letter that someone wrote to you about the experience they had here. It's, it's very, it's personal. It doesn't get more personal than that. So we have kind of that informal way. And then we have a formal way. We have a formal way that patients get to communicate with us. And maybe some of you have heard of some of this, maybe some of you haven't about this formal piece. As we all know, healthcare is always a very widely debated topic, right? People have very strong opinions and beliefs about it. What should be covered, what shouldn't? What should something cost? Should there be you know, healthcare for everyone? What does that look like? How do we pay for it? Lots and lots of questions. And I, I won't get into all of that, but I will get into the piece as it relates to patient experience. So every single patient throughout the entire country gets a survey from the government. 
And that, that survey is called the, it's an, there's an acronym and you'll see it on the screen there, HCAPS. And that is a very long title for a very long uh, sentence there of, it stands for Hospital Consumer Assessment of Healthcare Providers and Systems. Very long title. This is done nationally. And this survey comes from the federal government. And this survey goes, is potentially able to go to every patient. Uh, there's a few restrictions. Uh, you have to be at least 18 years of age. There's a few qualifiers, but essentially almost every patient can be surveyed. And the survey is the same throughout the entire country, right? Which makes sense, right? Whether you're a patient in Florida, in, in Texas, California, or New York, we should, you know, the government wants to know and ask the same questions. Now, the survey comes from the government and a piece of our results of how we do on this survey are linked and tied back to our reimbursement from the federal government. So what does that mean? So I always say, I kind of, I give you the, the 60 second version of this because talking about the Affordable Care, the pieces of the Affordable Care Act or Obamacare, however you want to call it, and how that relates to value-based purchasing, meaning how do hospitals get paid by the government, isn't the most exciting topic um, to go through, but, but I think this piece is really interesting. So, and this has been in effect now for uh, over nine years. So nine years ago, here's a very simple kind of, example of how hospitals got paid. And I'm kind of keeping it as simple as possible. Nine years ago, if a, if a patient came to the hospital, let's say to have knee surgery, right? They came into the hospital, whether they came into Lenox Hill, they came into a hospital in Texas, a hospital in North Carolina and Arkansas, it didn't matter. Let's say they came in for knee surgery and let's say the hospital got paid, I'll make up a number, let's say it's $6,000. The hospital got paid $6,000 to do that knee surgery. No matter when we did it, no matter how well we did the surgery, no matter what the clinical outcome was, no matter what the quality was, no matter what the score of this survey, this HCAP survey that people filled out, none of that mattered. We got $6,000. And that was what every hospital got paid. Think of it kind of like a menu, right? When you order the chicken, the chicken is $20, right? Whether you, you know, or the coffee from Starbucks is $2.99 here and $2.99 at this location. Hospitals got paid $6,000 for the knee. Today, and the last nine years now, the government has said, you know, we're going to not give you all your money, all $6,000 right up front. We're going to split your money essentially into three big buckets. The first bucket is, you know, the surgery, right? You did the surgery, we should get paid. So we'll get $2,000 out of that $6,000 for the surgery. Which is always like, great, thank you. We did do the surgery. We did take care of that patient. The second bucket is quality. So if a patient while they're here gets an infection for some reason, if the patient falls, if the patient has any one of these quality indicators, right, a CLABSI, a CAUDI, a UTI, again, lots of any sort of hospital-acquired infection, right, they got it while they were here. Or if this patient stayed longer in the hospital with us versus other patients throughout the country who get the same knee surgery, the government said, well, we're not going to give you your, you know, your $2,000, your second third of the pie. We'll give you $500. And we kind of go, wait, what? You're going to give us less money, but, but Mrs. Smith was here. We did the knee surgery and she got an infection. So she stayed in our ICU longer. And the government says, well, we know that, right? Because we have to report all of our, our data to the government uh, every year and, and continuously throughout the year. And the government says to us, but Mrs. Smith never expected to get that infection in your hospital. So we're not going to pay you for it. The third bucket, that, next, that last $2,000, is all about patient's experience, this customer service survey. So depending on how a patient fills out that survey, it changes the way we get paid. Now, nine years ago, Mrs. Smith comes in for a knee surgery, she gets an infection, and I'll, I'll make up a score, let's say one out of 100, the survey doesn't, doesn't work by numbers, but for, for this example, let's say we get a 50, we failed the survey, right? We didn't get, we didn't get full credit. Nine years ago, we would have got the $6,000. Today, the exact same patient, the exact same surgery, the exact same infection, the exact same score on the survey, we get about half that money. And that's what's changed, is that we are paid to take care of a population of people, and, we're, and, we're, and it's for every single one, every single time, right? So it's not just do we take care of most of the patients well, do we take care of every single one of them well? And this is what gets debated a lot in healthcare. This is one of the pieces, right? 
should about almost a third of the money be attached to reimbursement from this customer service survey? Does every patient know the power they have when they fill out this survey, right? Can we talk to the patient about the survey, right? I'll go through that a little bit. But the, it's a very powerful tool. And as a customer of it, right, as, as any of us would be, it's, it's really meant to provide the best quality clinical care and the best experience for every patient. That's what it's designed to do. And again, people agree with it, disagree with it. That is a whole separate uh, conversation that I could start uh, my own YouTube channel. I'm talking about is that, does that make sense? What should we do? What should we not do? Um, but that's the way things have been for the last nine years. Now, I wanna show you a few pieces of the survey because I think this is what's so interesting. So there are 22 questions on the survey. Again, the questions don't come from Lenox Hill. They don't come from any one hospital. They're across the whole country. There then are a couple of questions as you're seeing there that are called demographic questions that ask pa patients age ranges, um, you know, their overall health condition, just generic questions. We of course don't get paid on, on the answers to that. So it's 22 questions. And I'm not gonna go over all the questions with you, but I do wanna point out a few and kind of go over some of these categories. So there are seven what's called domains, but basically categories, as you can see on the slide. And the, there's seven of them are in blue. And you know, the, the thing that if you look at all of them, right? Communication with nurses, communication with doctors, responsiveness of the hospital staff, the discharge information, right? When patients left, the hospital environment, communication about medications and care transitions. How did a patient's preferences get put into, into their, their plan of care, right? When they moved, where they moved, did they go to rehab after, did they go home? So here are the seven. I always, you know, kind of say two comments about this. Number one is, if you look at this list very quickly, there are only two job titles called out on the survey, right? Nurses and doctors. Now, as we all know, there are many, many more of us in this hospital than just nurses and doctors. So I always say misperception can happen all the time. People think someone's a nurse, people think someone's a doctor, and maybe they are, maybe they're not. And the other thing I'll mention though is that under those categories, under those domains, there are three questions that we ask of each, of nurses and of doctors, and again, from the government, not, not from us. And I, I wanna tell you those questions, you'll see on another slide why, because you, know, you wanna get a flavor of what, what questions are asked on the survey. And the three questions are, did your nurse or doctor treat you with courtesy and respect? Did your nurse or doctor listen carefully to you? Did your nurse or doctor explain things to you in a way that you could understand? So three questions for nurses, three questions for doctors. So that's six out of the 22 questions already. So already everyone on this, on this Zoom meeting, you know almost a quarter of the survey already, right? That's, those are the types of questions it asks. And I'll come back to those questions uh, in a second. The other piece that a lot of people look at, right? Because there are 22 questions, there's a lot of different, there's a lot of data to look at. If somebody were to say, well, give me the big picture. How, how is everything going, right? Is the hospital doing well? Are patients satisfied? Do they like their experience? Are they happy with it? Give me the big picture, how's it doing? There's a question on there and it's the first one that's bolded there and it's called likelihood to recommend. And that question literally asks, how likely are you to recommend Lenox Hill Hospital or whatever hospital you went to, to your friends and family? And the thought being, if you're very likely to recommend it, you probably felt that we treated you with courtesy and respect. You probably felt we listened carefully to you. The thought is people are gonna recommend something that they had a good experience with. Now that's not always a perfect science of if, you, if that number's good, all your other numbers are gonna be good, but it's what a lot of us in the industry use as how are we doing, right? What's your likelihood to recommend? Are people going to recommend your facility? So, Here's always what I call the very, very fun part about this survey is the questions on the survey are all multiple choice. And at the very end, there's room for patients to write any comments that they'd like to leave, which again, we read every single comment that comes into the hospital from every single survey. Now, most of the questions are asked with, with the response of never, sometimes, usually, and always. And there's a few other ways to answer questions and you can see them there. So remember those, those three questions, really six, right? Three for nurses, three for doctors. How often did your nurses and doctors treat you with courtesy and respect? If somebody says, well, usually, and circles option C for usually, right? And how often do they explain things to you in a way that you could understand? Um, a patient says, you know, sometimes. 
we get zero dollars and zero credit for those answers. We only get paid when someone says always. We only get paid when someone says always and the other green boxes, right? Definitely yes, strongly agree and yes. Now, I'm sure, I know what, what all of you are thinking, right? Always, always, you want us to do anything always? This is a hospital, how, how, always is impossible, right? That's, that's a really high bar and I agree with you. It's a very high bar. And there's lots of things that go on in hospitals that are out of our control sometimes, right? Emergencies happen, Think, things go wrong sometimes. There's a lot of pieces that happen. But I have a few points to that. Number one, we all, and I know that everybody on this call, we all expect always from other industries, we just don't realize it, right? And of course, other industries are not paid based on it, right? We're the only industry that gets paid based on reviews, right? Our review, our survey controls a piece of our reimbursement, right? Because if I were to ask you these questions, and let's say you could only respond in one of those four ways, how would you answer the question? Let's say, how often do you want the pilot who's flying your plane to land it safely? Always, right? I think when any one of us, no matter where you're going, no matter how far or short the trip is, you expect that that plane is gonna land safely all the time. We have that expectation, right? Talking about food, right? How often um, do you want the chef preparing your food to wash their hands before they make your food? Always. Right? And for, for those of us who, who work and get a paycheck, and, and, and if you don't, when you do, how often do you want your employer to pay you on time? Right? There's lots of different examples where we, as a customer or a patient, expect always. We do. We all expect always. Now, is always difficult? Absolutely. Absolutely. It's a very high bar. It doesn't, it doesn't allow things to not happen. But if we go back and we think about those questions, right? How often should we be treating people with courtesy and respect? Always, right? How often should we be explaining things to them in a way the patients can understand? Always, right? And when we think about where would you, what, what answer are you comfortable with for yourself or your family, right? Answers like usually and probably are not ones I think that we're all comfortable with. And the survey also doesn't ask questions. Well, did you like your nurse? Did you have a good nurse? Did you have the best doctor? Because what's the answer to that question? We would all answer that very differently. And, it, and that wouldn't be fair, right? We'd all say something different. It also doesn't, if you look at it, all of these responses, there is no grading system of, okay, well, was the hospital good, great, or excellent? That also would be very unfair because how I define good is maybe how you define great. And so that's someone else's excellent. And it'd be very, it's very subjective that way. This measures the frequency of something happening. How often did this happen? And our key is that we want it to happen all the time. Now, again, I'm sure you could imagine how controversial this piece is. You know, shouldn't there be partial credit? Uh, shouldn't we get some money for usually and maybe half the money for sometimes? Again, that'll be on my, on my other podcast and YouTube channel to talk about should we have it differently? Uh, but this is the way that it is. And I know that if God forbid I was in the hospital as a patient or my family was, I only want the green answers for them, right? So I think we all, we all know that when it comes to us and of course then therefore when it comes to each other that we want those answers. Now, I wanna show you a piece of, um, uh, you know, one piece of data and I wanna go over kind of the one question I mentioned which is the big overall question. And this is actually where, I know there's a lot of us on the Zoom which is so incredible. Um, I wanna actually ask you guys a question and, and I know Rebecca is gonna help me kind of uh, see some of these answers and a little bit of a guessing game. Um, and what I always say is that we will do and play by, um, oh, sorry, hold on. We will play by the price is right rules and I've got questions in both directions. So, we're in, so the question we're asking is likelihood to recommend, right? How likely are you to recommend Lenox Hill Hospital? And there's two numbers, as you can see, two categories, one on the left, one on the right-hand side of the screen. And the one on the left says top box. And top box represents the percentage of patients that said always, or that definitely yes, those green answers. 
So I want to show you numbers from 2015 and show you where we are today in 2020. So this is a guess to everybody. In 2015, what percentage of patients do you think said they are going to always recommend Lenox Hill Hospital? Give me some guesses. Do you think it's 30%, 70%, 80%, 20%? 25%. 25, 30, 40, 80, I see 23, all, all 15%. Uh, thank you guys for all these guesses. Yeah, it's amazing. I think the highest I saw was 80 and the lowest I saw was 15. Okay. All right. So that's a, that's a good range, 80 to 15. That's a good, that's a good <laughs> range we have. Some people um, have, have no faith and some people have a lot. <laughs> I was going to say, right. I don't know if I should be I see honored 90. or insulted. I see 90 coming in now. So. Oh, thank, all right, now they feel bad for us. Thank you. Um, <laughs> so in, in 2015, we had 70.6% of our patients said they're going to always and definitely recommend Lenox Hill Hospital. Clearly much higher than some of you thought. Again, we won't take any offense to that. <laughs> um, and for those of you who thought we did a little higher, I apologize, um, you know, but we, we were at 70.6%, right? So not, not terrible, right? We've got a ways to go, but a lot of patients are saying, yeah, I will definitely and always recommend Lenox Hill Hospital. And that's what top box means, right? The percentage of patients that said always. Now, the other number we look at is percent, it's called percentile ranking. And that shows how did we rank nationally to all the other hospitals in the country? Because we get paid relative to where we come in, right? There are thousands of hospitals across the country. Now, again, every hospital is asking patients that same question. How likely are you to recommend that hospital? So percentile rank says, well, how do you think our 70.6, how did our top box score stack up to everywhere in the country, right? So I'd like to ask for some other guesses, right? So if you think, and I'll give you some context here. So if you think that our 70.6 is better than most hospitals, you should put us in a higher percentile rank, right? The 70th, the 80th, the 90th, somewhere in there. If you think that hospitals around the country have a score higher than that, then you think we're lower in a percentile rank, you could give me a number like 40 or 50 or, or 30 or 20. If you think everyone did better, you can give me a number like five, right? The goal is to be in the 99th percentile. Right, so in 2015, you now know that 70.6% of our patients said definitely and always. Where do you think we rank nationally? Rebecca, do we have some guesses here? We have about 100 guesses. I have seen right. everything from 50th to 90th, 95th, 99th, 82nd. Um, they are pouring in 60th. I think the lowest I had seen was 50th, was the guess. Okay, so 50 to 99. 99. Yep. Another good range, another very good range. I, I feel like you guys feel bad for us, that now you're, now you're giving me the best <laughs> answer. I'm okay with that, thank you. Um, so here's always the very interesting thing. So in 2015, 70.6% said always. Nationally though, that puts us in the 38th percentile. I'm sure if we were all in a room together, you would all, I would hear this, what? If you pull oh up the God. chat, you can see a tons of wows, what, oh my God. How is yeah. that possible? Geez, all of that coming through. So yep. the surprise uh, is there, you just can't hear it. <laughs> yep. um, so, and this, so I wanna put these out so you to see all of them. So in 2015, right? We were only better than 38% of other hospitals in the country, right? That means a, a lot of other hospitals were doing better. They had something higher than 70.6. Now, of course, right, when you look at one of these numbers, it makes you feel okay. 70.6 makes you feel okay. You feel like we're doing a pretty good job. 38 makes us feel like, oh my God, we're, we're doing an awful job, right? And, and it's really not that we're doing an awful job. The key to this is just consistency. How consistent are we? Are we being as consistent as every patient, every time, get this experience? So we did a lot of work between, the, between in these last five years. We did a ton of work. We did a ton of education. We did a ton of training. We read every comment on the survey. We listened to our patients. 
We have a patient family advisory council, which is where we bring back patients every month to the hospital. We ask them questions. We, we let them make the decisions. We've done a lot of work. And as you can see, we took our 70.6 to 77. Now that may not seem like a lot, you know, only moving seven points, but as you can see on the other side of the screen, look at the huge jump, 30 point jump we took nationally, right? And that's because every hospital is working on this, right? And it's kind of a big bell curve if you think about it. And the first flat part are hospitals that are in the first or second percentile nationally. And not many of them exist because many of those hospitals are potentially maybe closing or merging. There are also very few hospitals on the other side of the bell curve that are above the 97th percentile because that's really, really hard to do. So most hospitals live in the middle, right? They live in the middle of the bell curve. And so the race, right, the scoring of every hospital is so close. So you move one or two points, you can jump 10 points. You move seven points, you can jump 30 points. So, and again, this is all about what our patient's perception of their experience is and how likely they're, they're going to recommend us. So we're, you know, we're very, very proud of the work we've done. Uh, we're very, very proud of our 30 point jump on this side, our seven point jump on this side, but we still have ways to go, right? Our goal is to be at least above the 90th percentile, right? We, on the right hand side there, we wanna, we wanna hit 90. And our goal is 90 because you know, we know that, that the realistic thing is not every patient's gonna give us an always or a definitely, and for lots of reasons. Some patients, when maybe some of you, when you fill out a survey, you don't give the best answer, right? You give the second best answer, right? Because hospitals always have room for improvement. Uh, some people, you know, no matter what we do, it, it, it won't be right for them, right? We know that there's, we can't fix every single person and change everyone's perception and, and experience all the time. We try to, but we may not be able to. So our goal is 90. So we are, we are on our way to 90, which we're really proud of, but I wanted to kind of show you some of these numbers so you can see how we rank, um, how we rank nationally. Now, the, the other thing I wanna do, and I wanna make sure we open it up for questions and answers and, and, and uh, get to have a good conversation here, is um, um, at the very end of the survey, as I mentioned, patients have the opportunity to write um, anything that they wanna write to us, positive, negative, suggestions, recognition, um, opportunities they think we have. So actually I wanna, I'll do this one guessing too, Rebecca, if we don't mind. So at the very end of the survey, um, for the last even four years, what do you think was the most negatively commented thing on the survey? What was the thing that patients wrote us the most about and said, Lennox Hospital, I want you to fix blank. What do you think it was? Give Food. us guess. Food, cost, waiting time, nurse attitudes, a lot of food. A lot of food. Paperwork, yep, wait time, continuity of care, sanitation, treatment, space, it's a good, good one. Yeah. Cafeteria, parking. Very difficult in New York. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So lots, all right, so we have a spectrum. Okay, good. Interesting how food comes up all the time. Yes, a lot of food. A lot of food. Um, so you guys are right. So I, I like to share the top two most commented items. And you got one. There's still one that maybe someone listed, but we, I didn't hear yet. Um, what is something that is extremely important when you're sick, even if you're homesick with a cold? What is something you need to do a whole lot of? Any guesses? Rest. Yep. Sleep. Drink water. Yep. Sleep. Sleep. Yep. Well, Getting sleep. rest, right? When you're mm -hmm. home with a cold, that's why you're home. You're home yeah. so that you can rest. So if you're in a hospital, that means you're, you're very sick. You really need to rest. Mm -hmm. And if we talked about perception for a second, right, based on your, based on your feedback, you know, many of you don't walk into to any hospital expecting the best food in the world, and you don't expect to get a good night's sleep. And those are two things, when you're homesick, that matter the most eating healthy, nutritious food that's gonna help you get better and getting the rest you need, right? Why don't patients have that? And patients, and that was over the last four years, that was in the top two most negatively commented things was food and being able to sleep and quiet. And they mentioned a lot of the other things you said, communication, plan of care, the environment, 
And so we take all that so seriously. So I want to give you these two examples of things we have done in response to that. And I'm very, very proud of, um, of everything we have done. So our council that I spoke about, this group of patients said, you need to have quiet hours. You need to have time where we can sleep at night and you need to make it comfortable for us to sleep. So two years ago, we launched official quiet time throughout the hospital. Um, it starts at 9.30 and 6 a.m. Uh, every day. Um, and what happens during that time is there's an announcement that plays overhead, there's a wind chime, and we let patients know that quiet time is now in effect. We ask visitors um, to be respectful and mindful of that and potentially to let their loved ones sleep. We give every patient an eye mask and earplugs to, to relax, the option to have chapstick, a cell phone charger, headphones, whatever they need to, to rest. We slightly lower the lights in the hallways and in rooms. When it's safe, we slightly shut patient doors if we can, sometimes slightly shut shutting the door. And we, we make sure that the space is calm and tranquil. And we don't clean the floors and the hallways at night anymore, right? And I feel like some of us can feel that you hear, you see the Zamboni going up and down the hospital corridors, cleaning, making noise. We don't do that. We don't interrupt patients unless we clinically have to. We do everything we can, even using our inside voice, right? To be mindful of that so that people can sleep. And we've started to see great increase in patient comments that people are getting a good night's sleep and they appreciate the eye mask and they appreciate the small things we are doing. So we've done a lot on, on quiet. This, the second one, which is one of my favorite things, I feel like maybe all of us, there's an, there's an inner foodie. We all love, uh, love food, love different types of food. Um, so these are pictures of our actual food. Um, they, were, they were taken on an iPhone, which is why they're in all different angles, so people can believe that they're real. Um, we have truly transformed uh, the food experience at Northwell and very much at Lenox Hill. And we believe that food is medicine. And it is. And it's a part of healing. It's a part of getting better. Uh, there's, there's a nutritional component to it. We have our registered dietitians that help us. And we need to approach food differently. Why shouldn't food be incredible? And so we've done so many basic things. We no longer use frozen anything. No frozen meat, no frozen chicken, no frozen fish, no frozen vegetables. If it's not freshly caught or freshly in season, we don't serve it, right? Starting to make our own homemade soups, not canned soups, right? Doing all the things that we can to make the food fresh. We also went to room service. So every single patient at Lenox Hill Hospital gets room service absolutely free. The room service is served um, kind of, as you can see there, on glassware, on glass plates, on stemware, on china. They have a linen napkin. Um, and they can order anything they want within the hours that we have room service open for, pending, of course, their diet, right? You have to be, you have to eat appropriate to your diet that your physician has set forth and your dietitian has set forth with you. But you can order anything you want. Um, and you can order it when you want it. And so, we've really looked at food differently and we're very proud our chef here in the hospital is actually a two-time michelin star chef from france and pat from paris um, who's also a physician from uh, uh from paris so i always kind of joke and say there's no one more qualified to be making your food than a doctor and michelin star chef uh, and he is in the hospital right now um probably finishing up breakfast um, and, and getting ready to start uh, preparing lunch for patients so that this food looks the way that it does. And these are real photos of our food. Um, and I truly believe, and I, don't I can say this with some data, which I will show you on the next slide, but I know that we serve the best food in the entire country at Lenox Hill Hospital. And we're very, very proud of it. And, we're, and I love that this doesn't cost our patients anything. Nobody pays for this extra food. Nobody has to um, only, it's not that only certain patients get it. Every patient in the hospital, whether you're giving birth to a baby, whether you're here having surgery, or, or whatever the case may be, this is the food we have. And um, on the survey, we do ask patients, it's not one of the questions from the government, but we ask as Lenox Hill, as Northwell, a question on what was the quality of the food, right? Did, was it good? Because we want to know that. And, and the government does not reimburse us for it, um, which I think is a good thing. Um, and here is, we changed the food on one unit and here are the scores uh, from when we changed that. And if you're looking at the slide, I always say, this is my favorite slide. Um, 
And if you look at the bottom there, this is almost a two, almost a two year window from October of 2016, longer than two years actually, October 2016 till today, um, we were serving food and people were telling us that we were in the seventh percentile, the fifth percentile, meaning that 95% of other hospitals had better food than we did. And we made all the changes that I, I just told you about and a few others, and you can see instantly our patients noticed. And now, as you can see, we are hovering around the 98th, 99th percentile uh, in the country with food, which I think so, is just amazing. Yeah. You have about 900 people that want to check into your hotel. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we, uh, we get that a lot. We get that a lot. A lot of people say, and this is what's really crazy. Patients will say to us, we'll say to them, okay, Mrs. Smith, you're going home today. Do you have your ride? Let's figure out how you're going to get home. And the patients say to us, you know, can I stay till lunch? I'll have lunch and then I'll go. Because people want to stay and, and eat our, enjoy our food. They say, we'll go home after dinner. And when in any of our worlds did we think that people would want to stay in the hospital longer to get the food? And we're, we're really proud of that. So, uh, so we're, we're so grateful for these stores. So I will, I, that's kind of, you know, um, the formal piece that I had, um, you know, I, I've had a couple of questions here of what to talk about, but I, I really want to ask um, uh, you guys, what, what can I answer for you about anything? Um, hopefully you learned a little bit something new and different today. There have been tons of questions coming in. All right, I mean, fire away. So we can see some of them. Um, let's see. Some people would like to know, um, you know, what qualities do you specifically think that you've exhibited that have allowed you, you know, in nine years to go from a temp to the vice president at Northwell? It's a, it's a great question. Um, I think, I think the qualities were, and it's always hard to kind of talk about yourself and the qualities you possess without feeling like you're sounding like you're talking too much about yourself. But uh, I think I'm very passionate about what I do. Um, and a lot of the pieces of, I think, who I am today is be, and I truly believe this because I was, trained as a, as a theater uh, major. And I spent four years focusing on communication, focusing on being in the moment and making a choice and committing to it 110%. And when you think about it, and this may seem like a very far stretch, being an actor, right? When you're playing a character, you have to make a choice, right? Am I upset in this moment? Am I sad? Am I confused? What does confused look like? You have to make those choices. And the goal is that you want people to believe you, right? You want to show that you're authentically doing this. But you have to make that choice. In every one of our days and in healthcare, we have to make choices all day long. You have to commit to your choice. Um, you have to be passionate about what you're doing. Um, you have to be a team player. Uh, you have to be willing to be collaborative. And especially when, you know, as you can imagine, I came into healthcare, there were not many theater people left and right. There were not many people that worked in fashion. And my ideas probably seemed crazy. Uh, and they've never been done before. Um, but I, I was, as clear and open and honest about them as I possibly could be. Uh, and I, my goal was, which I told everyone was that I want to make this better. And I know what I know and you know what you know, and let's meet in the middle. So I think it's a, it's a combination of all of those pieces. But, but I, what I hope everyone feels is that you don't have to have a specific set background in certain things to, to work in healthcare or to work in experience. Um, and now as part of my departments, you know, I oversee not only as you kind of saw this food service piece and, and the patient experience piece, but I oversee our housekeeping and environmental oh. services piece because that's part of the experience, right? If you think of a hotel, the housekeeping piece, our doormen, our valet, um, you know, our, our kind of patient, we call, we call patient service facilitators, our, our clerks at the desk, our front check-in people, all part of experience. So I think, um, I think it's all those pieces. Fantastic. Hopefully that answers the question. Absolutely. Um, how do you def disseminate this information to physicians, nurses, you know, and get them to buy in to the scores? Great question. So the, uh, a bunch of these slides that I actually shared with you literally come out of uh, orientation we do with every new employee that starts at, at Lenox Hill and at Northwell, but specifically for us in the city at Lenox Hill and our other two facilities. And I spend every week, two hours every week doing um, this presentation and explaining patient experience to them, showing them the scores, just like I showed you, going through the data, going through the comments so that they understand, so that they buy in. I do that every single week for every new employee, no matter who they are. 
And then what we've done is Northwell and Lennox, we have done, um, this is part of what we call our culture of care. And CARE is an acronym that stands for Connectedness, Awareness, Respect, and Empathy. And that's a two-hour course that all 72,000 Northwell employees went through. And what we did was talk about slides that you saw today, some of our conversations, so that people know, you know, one, that our patients have a voice, of course, that we're listening to it, why we're listening to it. And of course, the reason we're listening to it is because it's the right thing to do. And we're all in healthcare to help people. Um, but we constantly are educating and and re-educating people on this. And then of course, as you'd imagine, we have weekly, daily, monthly meetings on this. And even to give you a quick example, every single Monday at Lenox Hill Hospital, uh, we have what's called our experience huddle. And it's led by myself, by um, Dr. Kalman, our executive director, our, our, our medical director, our chief nursing officer. And the, and the four of us come together and um, it's a 15 minute huddle for every supervisor and above. So it's about 150 to 200 people for 15 minutes every single Monday for the last couple of years. And all we talk about is patient experience. We look at the comments, we read the letters, and we talk about how does that connected, of course, to our employee experience, because they're so connected, right? We, have to, we all have to be good to ourselves so that we can be good to somebody else. 15 minute meeting every single week, led by the executive team here. And we do that um, as a way to, make sure that this is always part of the conversation. And I can, uh, I can validate that, that is true. <laughs> I, <laughs> I am participating in it as well. It's a fantastic meeting. Um, there have been a bunch of questions around how we monitor pediatric patients and the feedback for pediatric patients. Of course. So at Lenox, we have one pediatric unit. Um, and um, pediatric patients, um, we do send and give them a survey and give their families a survey. Um, and knowing that the experience is different. Um, that's not linked um, officially uh, to the government in terms of reimbursement. It's actually separate. Um, it doesn't, uh, I'll say officially count, if you will. Um, but we talk to them all the time. We have a, a council with them. We meet with them because things that, and we have um, what's called a child life specialist um, who works with kids of all ages on, you know, just dealing and coping with being hospitalized for however simple or complex of a procedure uh, because it's really important knowing that that's a very different experience. Uh, and as you can imagine, there's lots of little pockets of that inside the hospital, right? You know, new moms who are delivering, giving birth to a baby. It's a very different experience than someone who's having knee surgery. Very different from someone from a pediatric patient. Very different, honestly, from someone today who's a COVID patient. Mm -hmm. They're all very different. So we, we take their feedback. Um, we have uh, fun, kid-friendly food. Uh, we have Xboxes for every kid in their room. We have iPads for every kid in their room. Um, we have, you know, as much entertainment uh, as we possibly can. So uh, it's always kind of fun to be a part of, of pediatrics because you, you really, you get to work with kids and you get to help them and, and, and try to make, you know, as best of a situation as you possibly can. Absolutely. Um, how does the survey differ across settings? So from the hospital to the ER to the ambulatory setting? Great question. So I didn't even go that deep into it, but there are, um, there are exactly, as you just said, there are three, there are, there are five, uh, I believe, individual survey tools um, that um, uh, there's an inpatient survey, which is the one we spoke about for patients that are hospitalized. There's a different survey for the emergency department, and then there's a different survey for ambulatory surgery, people who have surgery at a facility or in an office and go home that day. Um, right now, reimbursement, the way and kind of what we spoke about, is only withheld for inpatient. The other areas um, we know and expect for it to happen, um, and we're already kind of on board surveying those patients, asking those questions. And again, those questions come from a large enough set of hospitals and the government across the country. So uh, we look at them very differently because as, again, you'd imagine if you're just coming in for uh, some stitches in the emergency department, different things matter to you. So the questions are a little different. Absolutely. And then questions around, does this apply to all payers or just governmental payers? Amazing questions, guys. Um, so in. right now, uh, this only applies to government payers, Medicare, Medicaid. Um, it does not apply to third party private insurances, United, Blue Cross, Blue Shield. Mm -hmm. Will that change? Um, again, that's another million dollar question. Um, maybe, when? I'm not sure. Um, but the thought is, is that we, of course, as the as the hospital, as the provider, 
it shouldn't matter whether you have insurance from United Healthcare, insurance from Blue Cross, Medicaid, you have no insurance. We should treat you with courtesy and respect no matter, no matter who you are, no matter what insurance you have. So we never, we never look at that on the patient side of what insurance you have equals what experience you get. Everyone gets the same thing, um, which, which is to me the most important thing. Absolutely. So a lot of great feedback on your background and how inspiring it is to see the different approach you know that you've taken and you know just the ability to think differently and what that can lead to so um i have i have one story i want to end on so i, would, I just need one minute when we end just so we have yeah time. Let's see, um let's see maybe one more question then through um a lot of questions on if the food in any way affects the patient's of the stay? And I know the answer is no, but maybe maybe you can explain how a little bit because people are curious. <laughs> yeah, no, it's um, it, when we made the food changes, the hospital for sure incurred a cost, right? Mm -hmm. it, it, this, this food costs more than the old food did, right? Using yeah. fresh ingredients, working with like local farms, um, it just costs a little more than buying things frozen, you know, from like a big uh, wholesale store, as you can imagine. Um, but what we wanted to do was ensure that no patient absorbed that cost. Mm -hmm. um, and so we found other ways in the hospital to, to kind of move money around so that we could pay for it for everyone for free, uh, because that was a big piece. When we set this out, we said we want to improve the food experience, right? And a piece of that goal is that it must be free. People can't pay for that. That would be very unfair. So yes. I, um, you can, if you're ever in the neighborhood, you're more than welcome to come by and uh, not as a patient, hopefully, but, but to come by and test our food. <laughs> you probably... I'm sure people will take you up on that. Okay, we have, we have three minutes left. We'd love to hear your story. Perfect. So I, um, I always, every week at orientation, as I mentioned, um, I end with this story when I speak to every new employee. And I, at the very beginning of, my, uh, of our, our talk today, I spoke about a moment that changed my life and a day that changed my life. And it was my fourth day at work as a temp. And this is when I knew I was going to do something different. So I come into work, um, it was a Thursday. We all started on a Monday and I went to two days of training and orientation on Monday and Tuesday, and this is Thursday. I'm sitting in at, at work, uh, just getting used to things. It's my, it's my fourth day. And uh, in from the door comes a volunteer. And the volunteer has this mini harp with her. Kind of looks like Cupid's arrow, right? And it's like, I'd never seen a mini harp before that was very small. And she was meeting up with one of the, the cardiac nurse practitioners. And they were meeting to go up to the units to go play music for patients. And I said, wow, this is so sweet. Like, I didn't know hospitals did that, that you have someone who plays music go up to patients at their bedside and, and play music. And so they said, well, Joe, do you want to come with us? And I said, sure. So we start walking. And I said, so where are we going? And they said, well, we're going to go to the CCU and the CTICU. And I said, oh, OK. I have no idea what those things meant. Um, and I just said, yes. Um, and CTICU stands for Cardiothoracic Intensive Care Unit. So these are patients right after open heart surgery, right after lung surgery, lots of different tubes, wires hooked up. These are very, very critical patients. Now, if you remember in the beginning, I told you if I see blood, I pass out. Um, so I walk on this unit and I look around and I start swallowing a lot. I get really white and I'm like, uh-oh, uh-oh. Like, this is, I, I don't walk the halls of ICUs many, you know, all the time. And I'm sure many of you don't. It's a very uncomfortable setting. You get nervous. So I'm being very mindful. I'm keeping my head down because I'm trying to, trying to not pass out uh, and make a big scene. And so we go to patients' rooms and we ask, you know, and the, the nurse, the nurse practitioner and the, and the volunteer ask, do you want us to play? And some patients say yes. Some patients say no. We get to the second to the last room. And there's a gentleman in there who had just been extubated. They just took out his breathing tube and he was not alert and oriented. And you could tell it was a very tense situation. His wife was sitting in the chair beside him holding her, his hand and she was crying. Her face was all red, she was crying. Their, their daughter was sitting in a chair in the corner and her face was crying. And so we walked in the room and the family didn't speak English very well. Um, it was their second language. They were an Italian family. And we, we said, you know, do you want us to play? And the daughter spoke a little bit of English, so she translated to the mom and asked the mom in Italian, do you want them to play the harp for, for daddy? And 
the mother kind of like brushed her hands off, like, no, 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 you know, like not right now. The daughter turned to us and said, you know, just play a little. So the harpist starts to play. 10, 15 seconds go by, you see, we see this like light bulb go off in the mom's head and she's thinking of something. And then she starts to talk to the daughter in Italian. And we're not sure if it's positive or negative yet. And the daughter talks to us in English and says, my mom wants to know if you know this Italian opera song. It's my dad's favorite song. Does, she, does the harpist know the song? The stars align that day. The harpist happened to know the song. So she starts to play it. The daughter goes to the other side of her dad and she takes his other hand and says, dad, if you hear this song, just squeeze my hand. We just wanna know you're okay. Please just squeeze my hand. 10 seconds go by. The dad opens his eyes, turns to the daughter and says, of course I hear that song. It's my favorite song. I lost it. I was crying. <laughs> I was going crazy. I couldn't believe it. I was freaking out. <laughs> I brought everybody I could find into this man's room to witness this miracle. And I wasn't making sense. I was talking really, really fast. I was like, you have to come here. This man, he was dead and alive in the heart. They saved his life, you have to come here. And they're like, Joe, calm down. I couldn't believe what I saw. The man made a full recovery and he wrote a letter to the hospital. And he said, thank you for saving my life by playing my favorite song. Now, I know I know I'm not clinical and I know it wasn't the harp that saved his life. I know it was the cardiac surgery that saved his life. It was the medication, it was the nursing care. That's what saved his life. But in a moment, because there's always moments where things are out of our control, that medicine goes so far and surgery goes so far, right? And things are out of our control. But the one thing that is always in our control is how we make people feel. And that day we changed the way that family felt and they felt loved and they felt cared for and it was incredible. And it's an incredible story because it has a great outcome and not every patient has that story. Not every patient gets music therapy. Not every patient wants music therapy. But I said, oh my gosh, I have to do this. And I didn't know what that meant at the time. Probably maybe like many of you, you don't know what you wanna do because I definitely did not wanna become a cardiac surgeon and I definitely did not wanna become a harpist. I'm terrible at instruments. And this world of patient experience evolved and I found my spot in it. And, and here I am nine years later today. And that's my story. <laughs>